Arnold, and on behalf of the Bob and Alicia Woodrick Diversity Learning Center, we're pleased to have you here for our 15th annual diversity lecture series. And um, a special welcome to Ms. Bridget Cazales Collins and Mr. Joseph Collins. And um, just a real sincere appreciation and thank you to them for all the work that they are doing. I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge a few individuals. Um, our board of trustees who work very hard for our college and community and are very supportive of our diversity initiatives. Ms. Terry Hanlon. And um, Dr. Richard Reiskamp. Thank you. And I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge our generous sponsors for the lecture series. Our champion sponsor is Steelcase. Diversity advocates include Warner, Norcross, and Judd. Diversity partners include Amway, Davenport University, Fifth Third, Michigan Public Radio, SMG Management, DeVos Place, Spectrum Health, and the Nokomis Foundation. We also have many diversity supporters and friends which are listed in your program. And for those of you who may be interested in supporting one of the programs through the Diversity Learning Center, um, there are donation envelopes on the information table and we welcome your support um, through the Grand Rapids Community College Foundation. I'd also like to thank um, the GRCC diversity team for their continuing commitment and a special thank you to the diversity learning staff, Jennifer Smith, Kathleen Owens, and Tambor Moore, and all our volunteers who are here tonight to help. And a, a really um, special thank you to Fountain Street Church for providing this partnership and this facility. It's a wonderful facility, so we thank all the, all the um, people here at Fountain Street Church. And for those of you who parked in one of the GRCC ramps, you can pick up a parking pass at the information table. And um, please do take a moment to fill your evaluation out. Your, um, your opinions are very important to us, and if you have any suggestions for speakers that you would like to hear as well. This is our 15th year for the lecture series, and we're really proud of our history and um, offering many diverse voices to help, to help engage our community in global and local viewpoints. And the understanding of multicultural and social equity concerns is a centerpiece of GRCC and is the mission of the Diversity Learning Center. Listening to each other promotes respect and provides insights that contribute to the health and well-being of our community. Again, welcome, and we hope to see you at the Diversity Lecture Series with Morris Dees, which has, has been rescheduled for April 1st. And now I am pleased to introduce one of our GRCC English professors and someone who is very instrumental in our women's studies program here at GRCC, Mr. David Cope, who will introduce our keynote speakers tonight. Thank you. Odd thing to be in a preacher's role. I'd like to start with a principle, uh, and the principle is one that I think applies to our speakers. The principle is feminist scholarship is activist scholarship. It's not ivory tower education. It's the idea of, thank you, it's the idea of compassion, rigor, and the idea of collaboration all together at one, and it's the idea of expanding consciousness. Um, we all hear about people that can talk the talk. We don't hear about many people that can walk the walk. The people that we have here tonight are two remarkable, remarkable people. Uh, I spent some time with them this afternoon. They have been walking the walk for more time than many of us have been alive. I want to kind of walk through it and introduce you to them at the end. We are about to witness what I would call, I could only call a complex nightmare. Um, that girls and women experience across the globe. We're going to be centering the to talk tonight in Nepal and in India, uh, but this is something that goes on everywhere. If you've been to the Women's Studies website, you realize that there are cases in Detroit, Washington, D.C., Miami, San Francisco, New York. These are ports of call 
for girls who are being trafficked here in the United States, and there are many others. Um, the question, I guess, that has been on a lot of people's lips, um, and uh, Brigitte and Joseph have both been very gracious in trying to answer it as carefully as possible, is what can we do? This afternoon, they cautioned us uh, against the tendency that so many of us have, what uh, I grew up knowing as cultural imperialism, um, the idea that we have the technology, we have the know-how, we can help people out of their troubles. Um, the problem with that mindset is all you do is alienate people from other cultures. It's an old story. They used to call it the ugly American. I think the thing we have to be cautioned about is jumping in with both feet and assuming that we can help without having a complex understanding, not only of the, tr of, the, of the problem itself, but of the individual culture, the language, and the people. Um, they were emphatic about this, and I think it's an absolutely necessary thing we need to do if we were to develop any sort of thing like that here at this college. And I'm for it, by the way. Um, we do need instruction about what we can do and what we cannot. I do want to do a brief survey, secondly and thirdly, of the complexity of this problem, and I'm not going to spend much time because I want them to get started. Um, when we look at what child sex trafficking involves, just a short list, poverty and ignorance in rural communities, lack of education for girls, lack of opportunities, ploys and forcible abductions of young girls, you're going to see that in the film tonight, a variety of abducting perpetrators, they range from trafficking rings to family members, to local recruiters, to trusted friends and neighbors, and to former abductees. Physical and psychological abu abuse, which is extreme, uh, involving repeated rapes and beatings, forced complicity and prostitution. Um, it's basically uh, the assassination of a person's psyche from within in some ways. The complicity of local and national governments, very often for profit, perhaps always for profit, Religious and cultural norms that tend to devalue girls and women. The problem of developing a coordinated international response. Okay, now, and having said that, they're going to be much more specific about it than I ever could be. I do want to talk about something, though. We talk about talking the talk. Um, we've known about this problem. Of course, the problem of prostitution is one of the oldest profession, as they call it. But uh, if we look at the history uh, worldwide of what the United Nations and others have tried to do, the first convention was the Trafficking Convention of 1951. They have known about this problem and they have tried to do things about it since then. There was the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, which was 1979. The Convention of the Rights of the Child in 1989. The Convention Against Sexual Exploitation, CASE, as it's called, 1993, and the famous Beijing Platform of 1995. And right now, in the United States Senate, there is Senate Bill 2925, the Trafficking Deterrence and Victim Support Act of 2009, which has been referred to committee. Hearings were held on February 24th of this year. It's a long ways from being adopted. That's walk, talking the talk. Things can come out of that, but it's not being on the front lines. And we, we need to have our guests take us to the front lines. Our awareness begins is a way to begin the process of change. But first we need to go to those front lines in order to for more fully understand the problem. And thus, I introduce to you uh, Maiti, 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 Maiti Nepal's Executive Director, Brigitte uh, Kazalis Collins, has directed and implemented major projects assisting refugees and women in both the United States and Nepal. In the United States, she was a member of the Tibetan Resettlement Project's founding board, which provided help for Tibetan families who immigrated to the United States. Okay. Associate Director Joseph Collins worked in Nepal as an economic advisor to the government ministries and the Central Bank of Nepal. His company, J.H. Collins & Associates, together with the Harvard Law School Program on International Financial Systems and KPMG India, uh, they have written and sponsored the passage of legislation to encourage foreign investment and development in Nepal. Part of the problem is you've got to create investment business and you've got to create opportunities for girls. And you have to create education for girls. You have to overcome a lot of barriers that are cultural and otherwise. Maiti Nepal, founded by the two of them, is a charitable organization based in Kathmandu, Nepal, 
formed in 1993 to combat the sex trafficking of women and children. My team Nepal has received numerous awards from the government of Nepal and prominent international organizations. Its leadership role in combating trafficking between India and Nepal is widely recognized by the international community. Its awards include World Children's Prize for, from the International Children's Organization of Sweden. Please give a powerful welcome to our two remarkable guests, Brigitte and Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening. good evening, and thank you very, very much for coming and allowing us to speak to you about this problem, and, and we're very grateful, of course, to everyone here at the Grand Rapids uh, uh, Community College, etc. We've been uh, welcomed and treated, spoiled, and we've warned them. We said that if you're nice to us like this, we might come back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. The program this evening is just is in two parts. Uh, the first part is a short clip of a film called The Day My God Died. This film uh, was done as a documentary in 2004. It was directed by Andy Levine and produced by Geraldine Dreyfus. It's a story of uh, Mayati Nepal and its sister organization in India and what we decided to do tonight was just show you a little bit of the film, show you 15 minutes of it, just to sort of get you uh, into thinking about Nepal and about what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit more about the film. I'm the associate director, Brigitte is the director, and started all this a number of years ago in Nepal when we've lived there for many years. The film is the documentary um, it uh, was uh, directed, as I said, by uh, Andy Levine. And it's a, a story of the individual girls and what happened to them as they passed through into Nepal. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, a, a film that I think you'll remember. And I also want to make it clear that if anybody here would like copies of this film, whether in the classroom work or anything else, we'd be very happy to provide it for you. The only other thing I'll tell you, just an introduction, is that the, the uh, director, the producer of the film, Geraldine Dreyfus, after seeing the work of Maya Tina Paul, seeing the tragedy of the sex trafficking, decided that she wanted to do something about it. And so she got together and developed another movie called Born into Brothels, for which she received the Academy Award. So this was the work that eventually led to Born into Brothels and additional recognition. So without any further ado, I'd like you to introduce my wife, please, Brigitte Casalise Collins. We'll just say a couple of words and then we'll show the film and then we'll be back. Good evening. I will be very brief uh, because I may talk a long time afterwards, so I'm saving time. Uh, we will show the film for a few minutes and then we can uh, go and maybe if there are a couple of questions before, if you want to do it that way, uh, we don't. Otherwise, we will talk and try to tell you a little bit about what Anurada calls her girls. And we are here tonight to tell you about the girls who are tonight not sleeping, but in the brothels of India and many other places around the world. So this is why we are here tonight. Thank you. 
भाग अल पर दीदी भन्थ मैं साइन ले कि उसे चीन जान थी अभी बीच में पुगे अर्क दीदीसंग मेरे ये साथी होने मैं चीन आए कि उसके बैनी बिस्कुट खानुन कि अभी बमे पुरा है बमे पुराई सके अच्छे वहाँ गए पे मैं बीज बच्चा बच्चा बिरा थे मेरे छोरी बिरा थे अस पच्चीस हेटोड़ा में डॉक्टर काली ज्यादा खेल तिम्रो नानी चाहिए धेरे बड़ी गड़ी सकता है निमोनी भग यहाँ तो होना मेसी में तरन पर्स कार्की काठम्डू लै जाओ कि बीरगज डंकन हस्पिटल में लै जाओ रोक्स में भर था अस पच्चीस मर्क आए फर्क आए जुत न खाने नानी अस्पार आई पे पे के होने जो दलाल तेल मैं नौ वर्ष देखि भाई मा, दाई मने को तो दलाल नौ नौ वर्ष आठ वर्ष तो टिक लगा नौ वर्ष में यहाँ बम लिया पुराइ दिल मैं चिने डॉक्टर इंडिया में राम डॉक्टर चिने पटना में तैं रोक्स एकदम राम डॉक्टर चिने अभी मसंग पैसा थे सोचे रेल में चढ़े रेल में चढ़ी सके पेप्सी मंगा दी तिना पेप्सी खाई सके मम आई पीछा थे तिना पचास हजार में बेचे गई According to the United Nations, 2500 women and children throughout the world disappear every day to be sold into sexual slavery. Mina, Anita, and Miley are but 3 of the 15 Nepalese girls trafficked daily, often by someone they trust. They wake up alone in Bombay's Kamatipura district. A veritable sexual marketplace of over 200,000 women and children, a captive population greater than that of Salt Lake City. This dense labyrinth of lanes and alleys is the largest concentrated red light district in the world. Tourists know it is called the cages. This place I am beaching around with. So, I am not happy. No, I am very happy. I am so happy. This is the work I am doing. I am going to do my work. I am doing my work. I am doing my work. कतिजान मंत्री रुगर थे सामान्य रुगर लाऊं थे मले ना मानता है आठ वर्ष हुए सात वर्ष में लोए थे One day she is a child, the next day she is a slave. It is as sudden and profound as that. अनुक्रम जाने इस तो उसले घरवाली लेके इस तो दिया चीज़ तो अलेस तो काम करना पड़ता है वो नहीं तो मले सारे के हाथ एक खुट्टा बांध दे रहा कोई लात समाधे इस बाल के रूम में लगाई थी लगाई थी जबरदस्ती देखा है पढ़ा देखा है कितने कोटि दिन हम लोग इस नाराम काम करने मानी नहीं का है तो अमीन मुनीबे दिन से बने हैं ना ये लोग 
तो कैसे भी तो मेरे को मार डालेगा मैं भी ठीक है मैं खुद कर लेगा करके मैं धंधे पे मैं निकल गया था खुद I'll try cigarette burning they'll try acid they'll try threats against the family they'll do whatever it takes Cigarette पोल के नहीं खाते क्या हो गर्म गए ना ये मैं चोर ले पोल का तो नहीं कती काल दे आज से दे दो And oftentimes they will actually just take her to a room and they'll have six guys and they'll just rape her and they will rape her and they will rape her until there's nothing left of that soul of hers. Ultimately every girl will break. If the entire myth or the fallacy is that if I have an STD or if I have HIV then I'm going to be cured of it if I sleep with uh, a virgin why would he protect himself? Why would he? दूरी ती न भी कोई छू सकी कोई हम आके दूरी चले जाए हम A multi-billion dollar industry with children as the commodity being bought and sold. Recruiters who scout them, traffickers who deceive them. the pimps and the madams who buy them and the police with their hands out and their eyes closed if we want to fight this entire system of child exploitation we have to do it by creating a system of safety we have to create our own network which would block the system off at each and every stage and the brawl keepers wake up every single day committed to their work they wake up very focused about what it is that they're doing and they're there all day every day 24/7 and somebody has to have the same sort of commitment to fighting the problem so this is going to be a determination about who is more committed at the end of the day it child what's going to happen what will happen to them i feel you know like it really scares me but then it gives me encouragement i must do something i must stop it We have all together four girls working for us as border guards. They are working together in collaboration with the police and the municipality. The ones who are being trafficked to India for prostitution, they stop because they as I told you they are themselves the survivors and they know the way of trafficking. So they know how to stop girls from entering into India. First you have to learn to take them as your own child. Then you will feel the sorrow and then the strength comes out from you to protect them. to take care of them gwati ka gwati ka sa kanda ho ola hera na mala hera bhane bhai hancha ne kina danaunu paryo na ta kela hai dine ne ga maardenam timla khadainam mo khanu pani sakdina timla timla maarnu pani sakdina apu le ga mala apu le ne kena dadne bhane ola le jannu huncha bhane wale nikal dincha e timi mero ma aune timro aama la khojera timro aama bau chaina bhane pani hamro ghar cha hamro ghar mai basera timi parle अरे माँ बाप नहीं है तो माँ बाप मिल जाएंगे माँ माँ तो अभी माँ माई की नेपाल में तो माँ भी है बाप भी है समान है बाबा का समान है पिताजी मम्मी का समान है बाप दिस गर्ल्स आर बिट्रेड दे नीड लव एंड केयर सो टू वेर डू यू गेट लव एंड केयर वेर यू गेट प्रोटेक्शन सो द ओनली प्लेस इज मदर्स होम माइटी मींस मदर्स होम इन � And if a rescued girl's family cannot be found or cannot accept the fact that she has been prostituted, Mighty Nepal provides that home. नहीं किसको भी नहीं बताया मैंने सिर्फ मेरा शादी के पहले ना सिर्फ मेरा मामू को तुम्हें बताया था। बोला था कि मेरे को मैं ऐसे चार साल एक जगह ऐसे गंदे जगह पे रह के आया था और मेरे को बीमारी है। वो तो बीमारी है ना कनिस में रह रहेगा तो वो पड़ गया हेड्स की तरह हो सकता है सो फार ज्योति's husband and child have tested negative for HIV grateful for her new life ज्योति reunites with her rescuers to save other girls now we're going to meet tonight with Mighty Nepal so that's going down tonight and then tomorrow we're planning to move on the raids in the morning and Joy T wants to go back to the brothel where she was held. What you have in Bombay is just the picture of what happens when no one pays the price 
for raping, assaulting, kidnapping, and ultimately murdering these girls. With Jyoti's encouragement, Kamachi feels safe to leave, and she, in turn, leads us to where other young girls are hidden. वो अभी ये घर है ना ये घर के नीचे नीचे जमीन के नीचे से ना ऐसा होल पहना था था फिर उसके अंदर जाने को थोड़ा दरवाजा छोटा जैसा दरवाजा बंद था बस उसके अंदर घुसने से दरवाजा बंद करने से भी नहीं दिखता Working together, Jyoti, Gary, and Kanar rescued six other girls in this one raid. The girls freed from the brothels each year number in the hundreds, while those still enslaved number in the hundreds of thousands. Clearly, the first line of defense is prevention. strongly that they would like to go out and talk. They would like to speak to other women and other girls about the danger of falling into a situation which seems hopeless. They want to be advocates. And they said, why don't you go to the villages and talk to the people there, that they should be more careful, they should be more responsible, they should look after their children better. They will talk about their rights and they'll make sure that it doesn't happen to other children. If the idea has come from them, so I'm very sure that they will. <laughs> they will do it. <laughs> When you speak about human rights or you speak about child rights, they should be universal. It's not just enough having things down on paper. It becomes our responsibility and the responsibility of each and every individual ensure that what we put down on paper gets implemented. This is the issue. If you really feel the issue, if you really love the issue, you will really work for them. If you understand the issue. If you do not understand the issue, you will just go on talking, 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 and talking will never end. Everyone has talked a lot. It is time for us to work. That is it.
Everyone has talked a lot. It is time for us to work. That is it. I'd like to introduce uh, <clears throat> the program this evening to really understand what trafficking means in an individual case. Because we want you to understand the obvious, I guess, that these are individual lives. They're not statistics. Each one of these girls has a story, and the story becomes ruined by people who use her. So I'm going to ask you this evening, if just for a few minutes you join me mentally, and I'd like you to try to just think for a second that you're a 12-year-old girl living in a rural area of Nepal, halfway between India and Tibet. <clears throat> you're 12 years old, live with your mother and father in a small hut that's probably the size of the men's room I just left. You live there uh, also with your brother. You don't really have a name. Uh, in Nepal, a little girl is really not that important. They probably call you little sister, daughter number two. Your brother you speak a local language, by the way. You, there are 36 different ethnic groups, and so you speak a local tongue. You speak what the villagers speak. Now, your brother, oh, he goes to school. Yeah, and he, he knows how to speak Nepali. But your mother told you that uh, you don't go to school. So you're old enough <clears throat> to help your mother and father. You old enough to plant rice. If you're rich enough to have a buffalo, you take care of the buffalo. You have a problem in the village that you don't really understand being 12 years old, you know. But your parents said there are a lot of people who live over there in those houses that are bigger than ours. And you know those children? You can't play with them. We don't want you going near those houses. And when, I ask, when you ask why, you don't really understand the answer, but they're higher caste than you are, and you don't mix. So that's your life. You've never been more than 500 yards from your home. Well, there is a road, come to think of it. Yeah, the, the, your father told you that there was a road somewhere. He said it was a two-day walk <clears throat> to the road. I, you, <clears throat> you don't know. You just take it on your father's word. And now, into the village and coming to see your parents is a woman. You don't, you don't really know who she is exactly. You think maybe you've seen her before. She seems to be welcome in your home and she's come several times and then one day your parents tell you that you're going to be going away well you've never been anywhere in your life <clears throat> and your mother and father tell you to pack your bag with what little possessions you have but you're going with her next day you leave your home forever that's who's trafficked. You, 12 years old. Now, what's really happened here? This is crucial. A human being becomes a commodity. 
she's bought and sold along the pipeline. <clears throat> Let me just explain to you the economics of this. The recruiter comes to the home and somehow dupes really well-intentioned families. Very few of these girls are actually sold. They're told that this is the girl's first year uh, pay and she's going to be getting a nice job in India or Nepal or someplace. And remember, a girl is an economic liability. She has to have a dowry and things like that. So <clears throat> the family accepts the money. Money changes hands. The girl is then taken to someone who will take her across the border. When she gets to the border, money changes hands again. She's sold to a broker. Now the bo broker owns her. <clears throat> now the broker has to make a decision about how he can make the most money out of a human being. He really has two basic choices. <clears throat> if you're lucky, you 12-year-old, you'll just be sold to the brothel. If you're lucky. If you're not so lucky, they'll take you to an illegal clinic in New Delhi, India. They'll remove one of your kidneys sell it for $6,000 U.S., let you heal, of course, then we'll sell you to the brothel for $1,500. Money changes hands again and again. And it's not over. No, no, no. <clears throat> you just arrive. The brothel owner pays for you again. Money changes hands again. And by the way, the 5 or 10 or 15 men a day, they, they pay they pay too. Money changes hands. Everywhere she looks, she's a commodity. And finally, even the police. Oh, they come every day to get the bribe to look the other way. A human being is a commodity. She's alone, abandoned, and never had a chance. Now, <clears throat> the other other thing I'd just like to mention to you before Brigitte comes here, <clears throat> I want to explain to you my first introduction, thanks to Brigitte, at Mayati Nepal. I was there on an economic project and Brigitte was, had found Mayati Nepal and she'll tell you about that. And she said, Joe, you must come down to the rescue center. I want to introduce you to Anurata, and I want you to <clears throat> see the facilities. We didn't have the nice facilities that you saw in the film. We just had rented all sorts of apartments and above stores and anywhere we could find. <clears throat> so one afternoon I arrived and uh, Anurata met me and said, oh, Joe, so nice to meet you. I think uh, Brigitte and I are getting, getting along together and we need help. And I said, well, that's fine, Anurata. And she said, may I show you around? I said, I'd be, I'd be flattered to show me around. So we walked into a sort of a dark area meeting hall, <clears throat> and there was a dark stairs, and we went up to the first floor. And Anurata turned to me, and she said, these are, the these are the rooms where we first get the girl when she comes back until we can make an individual assessment of what she needs, whether it's vocational training, medical training, whatever. This is where we have them in the beginning for just a couple of days. She opened the first door in that dark corridor. And there was a small room with three beds shaped like a U. <clears throat> and when I looked at the girls who looked at me and stepped back, every time they saw a man, it wasn't good news. I noticed how thin they were, how sick they were, how scared they were. She closed the door. Into the second room I went, <clears throat> opened the door, <clears throat> and I said, Anurata, there's only one, one girl here. She was lying in the fetal position in a bed. And Anu said to me, you know, many of them come back, they're so traumatized that they come back, assume this fetal position. We can eventually coax her out of it but she'll be this way a long time. She closed the second door, and I'm upset. 
I can't help, I've never seen man's inhumanity to man like I saw that day. <clears throat> and I went into the third room, and apparently these girls had just arrived a day or so ago. And Anu said to me, uh, I want you to see this one girl here who was 50 or 60 pounds soaking wet. And she had a sundress on the back, and she said to the young lady in Nepali, turn around. Now, you know what an iron is shaped like? Points at the top and then flat at the bottom? She had the mark um, twice from the top of her neck down her back, along her buttocks, and all the way down to her ankles. That's how she'd been tortured to submit. This is when I'd had enough. I said to Anya Rada, and I lied like a devil, I said, you know, I have to be back at the finance ministry, uh, and, and, and I, I, I really have to go now. I didn't have to go anywhere. I was so upset I didn't know what to do. I'm an ex-Marine. You know, I'm supposed to be a tough guy. I couldn't stand it. I walked back those stairs. I got in the back of my car. I cried like a baby. And that's what we see every day. I hope that brings this down the first stage of us talking to you this evening is to bring it down into reality. That's ugly. It's man's inhumanity to man. I, and how many girls? Our best estimate is that 20,000 girls go from Nepal into India every year. We, this last year we saved 2,700 girls and brought them back. A lot got through. So I'm going to turn it over now to Brigitte, who really is the, is the originator of Friends of Maya Tina Paul, who saw this injustice and stepped up and did something about it. So I'm very proud to introduce again my wife, Brigitte <laughs> Casalise Collins. Thank you, Joe. Um, it's very hard to start and try to have a smile on one's face, but I'll try. There are some happy time, even at Mighty Nepal. Just let me tell you how this adventure began. Um, one often day, Joe suggested that we should go to base camp of Everest. He is a mountaineer. I was not. I was born at sea level. And I uh, skied in my life a little, but that's about it. And he said, if we do things well, we'll be able to go. We plan it for a year, and we'll be going. But I just want you to know that I don't know what the future reserves us, but it's probably going to be a life-changing uh, travel. Are you willing to take the trip? And I said, yes. And here I am today. When we came back from Nepal, Joe... Uh, really wanted to do something uh, to try to make a difference in the economy of Nepal and to make a long story short of 15 years. Um, he was the first foreigner to have a act passed in the parliament of Nepal unanimously. And sadly, uh, the Maoist uh, started to do damage in the country and the, the project is on hold. In the meantime, I was very lucky um, to be in a foreign country, and I am a foreigner myself, and um, knowing what makes people tick in other cultures uh, is something that I will do for the rest of my life. I am curious. I want to know it all. And so I had the pleasure and the opportunity to understand the Nepalese community and to get to know also how we, the Westerners, um, try to solve the world's problem abroad. And I saw it uh, very well every day being in Kathmandu. So when I decided to do something to also try to make a difference, I decided that I was not going to be another Western entity trying to tell people what to do. I was not going to try to reinvent the wheel, but I was going to choose a Nepalese entity, a group, 
which was who knew what they were doing in their own culture. And I and Joe, who had kindly offered to join me, would be able to help them with our Western skills. So I came upon Anuradha Koirala, and uh, we became sisters right away. We are very practical minds. We don't waste time um, with the rest. We want to accomplish things. And uh, we met, and I asked to her, what can I do? And she said, please tell the world about my girls. And this is why I'm here today, trying to tell you about Anuradha's girls. They are also mine a little bit, so I'm sharing them with her. Um, Mighty Nepal is an extraordinary place. Um, as I was saying, Anuradha is very, very practical. And she really has thought from A to Z how to help those girls. It just, she does not meet a, miss a beep when it comes to one area. Everything is covered. Um, I compare Mighty Nepal to a beehive. And I don't know if she's the queen because she doesn't lie down anytime, anytime, anytime during the day or night. So, but the beehive is constantly working, has wonderful workers, and those workers are survivors of mighty Nepal, of sex trafficking. Um, I just want to tell you for a minute the context, context in which um, the cultural uh, context of Nepal in which a girl is being born. Of course, many dissertations have been written about it, but I will not give you a dissertation. I will give you a few lines so I may peek so I don't forget them. You are born a girl, and you really are born a second-class citizen. You will probably never go to school, although things are changing. You will, have, you will be a financial burden to your family. You will menstruate, and from that day on, you will go into the cow shed every single month that you menstruate as an adult woman, as a young woman, and you will not touch food in the household for a week. You have, have no choice in your husband. He will be chosen for you. Still true in most countries, we are starting to have more love marriages uh, in the more educated world. We will tell you upon your wedding, may you have a thousand sons. You will, be a, you will have an arranged marriage. You will be married to a stranger. And what is probably the saddest for me, and really that's what the meaning of mighty Nepal really is, beyond my mother's home. It is the home which you will leave upon your marriage to enter a family of strangers to whom you will belong to never to return to your mother's home. And in many, many cases today, few of my friends in Kathmandu still live this life, but in many, many areas, it is a goodbye forever to your mother. So you can imagine what mighty, Nepal, mighty means to women throughout uh, Nepal. Why is having a son so culturally important? It is very important because he will carry the name, he will uh, maintain the home, and furthermore, until recently in Nepal, only boys, only sons were inheriting the family uh, property. Properties, I should say, property. Um, then there is also, he will marry, but contrary to his sister, 
he will bring in a girl into his home, in the home of his parents, and he will take care of his parents. And f when they die, he will be the one to light the pyre, and he will be the one to send them to heaven. That is changing also, thank God. We know several families, several friends, and the daughter was the one to light the pyre, but it doesn't happen in the small towns. Let me focus on mighty Nepal to give you an idea of the A to Z that I was talking to you earlier. Joe, if you want to jump in, you're very welcome. Prevention, rescue, intervention, and aids to the survivor is what we do. That is a lot on our plate. And the sex trafficking is something for me um, important because not only was Anuradha involved in sex trafficking when sex trafficking didn't exist and the word sex trafficking didn't exist, forgive me, but on top of this, in 1992, Joe and I were involved in Boston in a rather uh, sad case of sex trafficking of a um, gentleman who would bring girls from India into America, so, uh, marrying them under many pretense, educating them. So the word sex trafficking for us um, is still new, but we have lived it a long time. Um, through since 93. So as I was saying again, Anuradha, her genius is to be able to grasp the total complete aspect of the beehive functioning. And one day Joe and I were talking to her and we said, you have all those girls around you. How, how do you make them work the way they do? H how they, they, they help their sisters, they have a baby in arm, they, they clean, they cook. What goes on? And Anuradha looked at us, sort of saying, not too bright. She said, they need no push from me. They know what the brothels are like, and they are here to save their sisters. We indeed had not thought of it, and if we Rose all of a sudden realized the weight of what she was saying. Prevention. Um, there's so many things to tell you. Shall I start by? Um, prevention. Since we are friends of Mighty Nepal, I might start with us. Prevention. We have um, awareness programs, as you saw in the films. You saw we go into those awareness programs. Those are probably one of the happiest times uh, to be uh, working because we go into the hills and we, uh, the villages are very sp uh, spread apart, so we spend the morning gathering people and there is not one trip where parents come to us and say, my daughter disappeared two years ago, my daughter disappeared six months ago, so we gather as many information as possible we take pictures of the parents of the house, and hopefully we can sometime along the line match uh, her to her parents. And what Friends of Mighty Nepal and the people who have been donors have been helping us do is that we created a pamphlet. I one day at a meeting said, do we have a nine, uh, 800 number in Nepal? And it had just happened. That was four years ago. And so I said, I don't care what it cost. We go to the post office, which was still dealing with telephones, and we get grab the first number, and hopefully it will be a good number. We ended up with 9999, which is pretty good. And we decided to, dis to design a pamphlet. It's in Nepali, three dialects, the most spoken, and then cartoons, because many people don't know how to read about, you know, be careful if you get in this situation. And then in the back, we have 1-800 numbers, how to, for people to call. And uh, we have a little anecdote for young girls to, to call. 
And the first few times that it was installed, we were not getting any phone calls. And we got very concerned, and it went on and it went on. And one day we were told, you know, in Nepal, if you f call, you must pay, you must put your dime down and better put it or you won't call. And um, the um, operators had not been told by the telephone company that when you have a 900 number, nobody pays, it's free. So we had good plans, but being Westerners, we didn't think about that second step. We solved that and here we are with this. We are printing those by the hundred thousands and we are also having placards, billboards at bus stations and train station to bring uh, awareness. Do you want to say something? So this is what um, our wonderful donors have helped us do and it's very successful. We also have a FM radio, which is very important in Nepal because of, as you know, Nepal is uh, to, uh, from uh, 5,000 miles, 5,000 feet Kathmandu to 28 uh, something, almost 30,000 Everest. So it's very difficult to get good communication. So FM radios are everywhere and they've become our allies, the allies of mighty Nepal. Rescue intervention, I know that Joe is one, this is one of his pet projects, so I think I'll give him a few minutes to explain. There are uh, 26 recognized border crossings between Nepal and India. Uh, you saw one there. This it's, is the map you saw earlier on the film. That's the map that's here. <coughs> you can imagine what a border crossing looks like in India with cows and dust and trucks and people walking across. It's an open border. You can just walk across in any way you like. And so Anurata, uh, 12 years ago, initiated what we call a border transit home. And a border transit home is what we do is we rent and occasionally build, if we can afford it, a small place where we have eight girls who've all been trafficked. We have a little kitchen, one thing and another, <clears throat> and then we petition to have a lady women's police unit very close by. We have a chaperone, we have a guard. And these girls have been trained to look for survivors at the border. So how, what, what, is, what does that mean? It means that the first group get up well before dawn. They in the street and they watch. The police are always close by, if not right with the girls. <laughs> and if you, if you ever think of who is a heroine, it's these girls. They are 60, 70, 80 pounds at the most. They stand in front of these vehicles, these trucks, buses, big trucks, the baggage up on top with the chickens and the whole deal, and they stop them. And the drivers always say, uh-oh, here's the girls from Mayati, Nepal. And what happens is they get on the bus, followed by the policewoman. And these girls have been trafficked. You talk about street smart. You talk about understanding all the ethnic innuendos of dress. They've got it. And they walk up and down the aisle, <clears throat> look at everybody. No, nope, nobody here, off the bus. <clears throat> We, uh, at a typical border crossing station, we rescue about 250 a year or almost one a day. What happens is when they see a young lady who they believe is being trafficked, they say to the policewoman, <coughs> uh, this person I believe is the trafficker, maybe a man or female, <clears throat> and these two girls. And the training is quite simple. The girls are taken off the bus by our girls, by the Mayati Nepal girls, and they take them around to the back of the bus. The policewoman takes the man or woman around to the front of the bus and they ask the same questions. And the girls at the back of the bus <clears throat> are saying, where are you from? What's the story? Who's this person? What language do you speak? They can tell very quickly. I'll give you just one example of how attuned they are. 
we were at one of the border crossing stations and we saw the girls, we saw some commotion in the bus and we knew some were coming out. And as they came out of the bus and they went around, one of the girls gave me a smile. She knew we got some. Afterward, I said to her, how did you know? She looked the same to me. She said, Uncle Joe, did you see the way she walked? I said, yeah, one foot in front of the other. I didn't see anything. Said, no, 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 no. You see how awkward she was in shoes? She's never had a pair of shoes before. That one was easy. Usually they can tell because the, the trafficker will buy her some clothes. So usually she's better dressed perhaps than she might normally be. Sometimes she has the luxury of a little $3 Chinese radio. I'm not sure she even knows how to run it, but she's got it. It's something new, something new. That's what we do every day. That's the combat zone. That's where we try to save lives, and that's really the beginning of this whole process that Brigitte's now going to tell you about. <clears throat> but this is where it starts. Sometimes they stagger across the, bus, the, the border to, to us at having escaped on their own. But we ha once we get them at the border, then the entire Maya T organization goes to work. And Brigitte's going to go into this in, in, in great detail. But we want you to understand why. We own her. Nobody wants her. She's sick. She's spoiled goods. She's this, she's that. She may be pregnant. Who, who? She has problems. <clears throat> she certainly's got some sort of problem. So. so we take her back into the border crossing home and we talk to her. We make out a report. The police make out a report. And there and then we make a decision. We take the moral responsibility. We've got a life. And we've got to do the best we can to get her back into her society as best we can with as little damage as possible. That's really the heart of Mayati Nepal. A lot of people are excited about the border crossing stations, and I love to go out there because I can see the work every day. I see there's one we didn't miss. But really what Brigitte's going to tell you about now is all the services they provide, the vocational training and everything. And let, I will go back to that, but I, I just wanted you to understand we talked about the 12 year old girl. Now we've talked about the front lines. And now here's what we do behind the line. Here's where the army is behind all this. And I guess the one which um, the world of sex trafficking doesn't think as much, but again, being a practical person and Manurada being a practical person this is the reality, how to take care of those girls, of the survivors, of the dying, of the, those who have HIV, and how to feed them every day, and how to take care of them on a daily basis. So that's what we do at Mighty Nepal, and this is where the girls come in, and they will, uh, on laundry day, every, all the laundry is on the, um, on the lawn, uh, the, the day of wash, hair washing, the babies are being taken care of, the sheets are being washed, and the little girls and boys are going to school, and some others are going about their days. This is what Mighty Nepal is all about. It's a constant, it's the beehive I was telling you about. This is real life, and what for me is a little bit annoying is that I can't write a grant and say, can you please feed my girls, buy them uh, diapers, monthly diapers. Then, uh, can we also have, by the way, uh, rice and beans and a few forks and glasses? There is no grant uh, process for that, unfortunately. So Anurada by hooks and crooks, I think is that the expression, hooks and uh, by hook or by crooks? She might, sorry. It doesn't translate like this in French. She manages to, to, to do it, and we are there to help her to do that. What we also have is a lot of training. Uh, we have hairdresser training. We have uh, woodworking training. 
we have restaurant training, we have many training because those girls, even though they have gone, and I'm sure some of you are work, working with survivors, whatever uh, trauma they went through, people want to regain a normal life, and that's what we want to do, give them back a normal life, even, by the way, as you saw it in the film, getting married. And sometimes Anuradha takes a lot of um, uh, slack from people who say, well, how can you possibly accept that those girls get married after what they have uh, gone through? And she says, those girls are Nepalese and they want to be mothers because this is what they know. So all of this we want to get to them, to give to them and to bring them back into as normal a life as they want. They do beautiful handicraft work. They are determined to earn a living and they are determined to eventually be free and go back on the road. And some of them, usually when they are much older, will not recover well. And we have lost, I could not tell you that it's 100%, a very small amount, but we have lost a few who have gone back to, uh, to being in the world of prostitution. But um, that's not an uncommon situation. So let me just, in conclusion, because you've been very patient with me, I just want to tell you what a day at Mighty Nepal is. First of all, you've got to get up very early and it's cold, there is no heat. It's very cold, but you get through it. All of a sudden, you know, everything comes alive. The, the girls are cooking, the girls are sweeping the floor, and Nepalese are very good at sweeping. They always, somebody is always sweeping. The kids are going to, getting ready, breakfast are being made, uh, dalbat is, you smell the smell of dalbat, the kids are starting to wake up. The people, at the, the elder are taking care of the younger. There is always an older kid taking care of the smallest one, and that goes very far down. It goes probably, the first one who takes care of somebody is no older than two years old. He, uh, two, two years old, he just takes care and he just goes on. And this is also maybe a day where we're going to prepare an awareness trip. So that's great also because the girls get dressed, we prepare the food, because what we are going to do is in order to entice the, um, the uh, people, the peasants to come who are very, very poor is to offer them a meal. Offering a meal in Nepal is part, you always offer food to people. You cannot go to somebody's house and not want to eat, that's a crime. There is always something how poor, how, no matter how poor one is, they always have something to offer you. So what we do is that we go to their place and we plan a whole um, uh, big uh, pots of rice and everything. So this is what happened. Sadly, at the hospice, we may hear that a girl is about to die. So we have to call the ambulance and we have to have uh, a doctor come and uh, we may have a new girl come in who came last night. And also, we um, have girls who have been rescued last night. We just got from the phone that we intercepted five girls yesterday. So this is the joy as part of it, of, of my team. They, we all rejoice for those things. And then a typical morning, the kids start going to school and then everything is happening. We can have the police come in and have drive in with rescued girl and um, um, the traffickers in one corner. Uh, we may have, and I've lived all this and Joe has lived it all. All of a sudden we are screaming and yelling and it is a battered woman who has been saved by uh, some um, cousins or companions because he, her, her husband was about to kill her. Then we have some urchin coming in dirty who have not had food for several days. And you say to yourself, why is Mighty uh, the recipient of all this? It's because Mighty really is the place where 
everybody goes when we have something like this. And Mighty never shut her door. And Mighty will all, always find a bed for any of those people. And this is what our day is all about. It does not stop. The last time I was there, the shouting match was on, and it was a young bride whose in-laws had discovered that she didn't have a perfect skin when she was trying her sari on, and they wanted their money back from the diary. And they were screaming and yelling, and Anuradha was in the middle of it, and it just doesn't stop. That's my tea. There is no social services run by the government in Nepal and in many other countries. And this is why Mighty is such a place. And this is why we want to work with her and give her as much support as possible. This is what Mighty is about. And this is why we love to help her. We want to help her. She is making a difference tonight in another 100 girls tonight. And we want to support her and we want to do everything we can to help her alleviate this horrible, horrible man's inhumanity to man. And she has all our admiration and uh, our love. And I'll stop there. Questions, yeah. <coughs> if you'd like to ask a question, you can step up to one of the mics. Or you can shout. <laughs> I'll start by ans answering a couple of questions while you think about it. We're often asked, you even saw it in this segment of the film, were those real pictures in the brothels? And the answer is yes. There's a charity called Witness that if you do this kind of undercover work, provides you with glasses with a camera in the center. And you might have also noticed that the, some of the men's faces were blotted out. At the time, it was grainy. At the, this is when that happened. Those are the people, the, the, men, the young men in India who help us set these things up. And obviously, we wanted to protect their identity. But everything in that film, <clears throat> the day my God died, is authentic. That would, just it, shot the way it was. It takes about six months to get the <coughs> confidence. You, for those of you who didn't see the whole film, it takes about six months to gain the confidence of a girl in the brothels. So those young Indians go into, into the brothels and talk to them and talk to them and so until they have enough confidence. And then we tell them that there is going to be a rescue. And, and so this is how we gain their confidence. Well, um, she's going to be forced to have an abortion. There is no choice. I mean, unless uh, for some miracle she can hide it, or, uh, so, but she's going to have an abortion. And sadly, she, did not, she does not get two weeks to recuperate. She's thrown back into the brothel very early. However, we have many girls when we rescue them who are pregnant. And we take in the babies, and uh, we are lucky enough to um, have not too many babies with HIV, but we have enough, sadly, that uh, who die when we, they come to Mighty. And we have girls who die from HIV also. We are told that it's lucky if she gets one day off, as awful as that belief. Yes, please. What time, what time of punishment do the traffickers get? What time of punishment? What's the question? What time of punishment do the traffickers get? Um, le let me be positive uh, and say that we are making progress. It's very slow, but we are. Um, but most of the time, the traffickers will be very smart. They will escape. Uh, for example, when I was there last, there was a group that, which tried to bring the girls 
into India by plane. And by the time the uh, uh, custom officers realized what was going on, the, the, the guy skipped and, and left. So, and also they can bribe somebody, sometime the police and go. It's a very slow process and it's very hard for the girls. And although we are getting ground, still being a lawyer, women lawyer in front of all these men is not an easy task. So we are a few years behind. Let's also remember that the judicial system is corrupt. And usually the lower case courses like this, it goes, the judge just goes to the highest bidder. So because this is such a profitable business, many of them, we take them to court, we have a volunteer legal staff, but most of them buy, buy, their, buy their way out. Okay, go ahead. I see, I see a finger, but I, I don't see the, the whole body. <laughs> Sorry. Well, yes, definitely education, uh, education uh, of, of, of <coughs> the woman in any country is really a big, big part of the solution. But let me take a moment to say that it's a, it's a whole context of cultural context. Um, not too long ago, your great-grandmother and uh, your mother, and some, I'm talking about general throughout the Western world, uh, did miss a few rights. My mother um, could not write, and I'm not 90 years old yet, could not write certain documents for her children without her husband's signature. Only did Mr. Uh, Pompidou started to do that. So it's not too long ago that um, the, the women's rights, even in our country, has been happening. But also the men, the attitude of men and brothers and uncles and sons have to change. And I'm afraid, and I dare say, that in the work of anti-sex trafficking we are doing, we, the women, tend to sort of grab this subject for ourselves. And I don't appreciate that, and I don't want it, and that's why my husband is with me, is that it is not a women issue. It's a man and woman issue. It's a cultural, it's a, it's a collective issue. In certain countries, due to religion, <coughs> due to caste, due to many things, you know, uh, women are second class citizen. And it's, it's the thing which is going to have to change. And it's changing to a certain extent, but some laws in the books <coughs> are still written against the women. And let me just add to that, that <clears throat> In all of my years there, there was a lot of economic development work and schemes about how to help. And at the end of the day, the developmental economists don't agree on a lot, but they agree on one thing. If you want to do something to begin change, you teach the women to read. Because she runs the household, really. She'll teach her daughters and sons to read. She'll read the seed bag. She'll read the fertilizer. They will be better off. And once she can read, the positive force begins. That's universally accepted. That how to help. Does that answer your question? Does that? Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, what, what I, I don't think, uh, if I understand your question correctly, it's really not the parents. It's just that, you know, if you're um, in the middle of nowhere and somebody comes and asks you uh, to take your daughter and, and you know, remember, uh, I'm sure uh, 80 years ago or uh, before World War I in this country and certainly beyond World War I in my country, you still had country girls who would go to, um, to uh, big cities, we would go to Paris, and we would be thrown into brothels the same way. But the family was not conquering to that. It's just that it was one less mouth to feed, and she would go out and earn a living, and maybe in the long term help the family. So 
I, I don't think that, I think that's because the girl is so second class citizen that this tend to happen more because we sort of accept that situation and that has to evolve. But as we hear news uh, intermittently from uh, Nepal, uh, Tibet, China, India, right in that area, on the shifts in the government and you mentioned the Maoists, is there any news when we would hear those reports that would bode be better for this situation? Are there any government, are there any active uh, political parties that are working uh, to rid uh, the area of this problem? <coughs> uh, before the Maoist revolt, uh, which really uh, has started in the middle 90s, uh, there were three dominant political parties, the Royalists, the uh, Marxist Leninists, and the Social Democrats. <clears throat> and in those days, it was a constitutional monarchy. It was a monarchy until 1990. He was overthrown. They settled on a constitutional monarchy. That monarchy did not rule well. They don't really understand. It took us from England in the middle 1600s to evolve into really understanding what democracy is and unfortunately, right away, the corruption, which you could expect, uh, the lack of, of, of any competence on the fact that any minister, it's some sort of political payoff. So the government, the, the constitutional monarchy didn't work. The Maoists came along and they did the old trick. The guy's house up on the hill, we'll get him. And we're gonna separate the land, just a standard complaint about an upside down society. I mean, th that's some, there's a truth to all this. The government didn't listen to them. I sat in many, many cabinet meetings in Nepal, and they would ask me, what's the story, how's it going? And I would say, with all due respect, if you don't do something about the Maoists, they're gonna change this country. And then I would give them the story about Fidel Castro. Well, who's Fidel Castro? They did. I said, he arrived in a rubber boat in Cuba, and four years later, he was running the country. You have to take these people seriously. Oh, Joe, they've got muskets and swords. Well, they don't have muskets and swords now. They have an army, automatic weapons, <clears throat> and they fought to a draw, and the, Nepal fell apart. The UN came in there and did very little. All of the international, the U's all came in and did what they could, but it didn't help much. And so what you had is finally an election, which was held about two years ago. And that election was... Let's just see who's in charge out there now, and let's make this group who, that we elect to draw up a new constitution. The Maoists, basically out of fear, and told people if they didn't vote for them, they were going to go back to the jungle. Got a majority, but not a total majority. So you now have a fourth party called the Maoist Party. You've got a country with an, His Majesty's army locked up by the UN, not only allowing them to go out and do anything, you have the Maoist army down in UN compounds, and now you have another uprising further on the border of another ethnic group. Anarchy. Absolute anarchy. Now, you always hope these things will eventually hit bottom, but I can tell you that there is no progress at all, but the country continues to deteriorate. You're not a country if you can't control your own borders, if you can't pass a law, and, and, and it's very, very sad. And, and, and not getting, not getting any better. I'm sorry. And to what say. and what has happened now is that unfortunately we are having um, uh, <coughs> what we call here domestic trafficking, um, and that is within people uh, people bringing now the girls because it is much cheaper to not have to bring a girl all the way to India but keep her in Kathmandu and you can make uh, maybe not as much money but since you pay less, you will make more money in the long run. So we are having a lot of what is called cabin restaurants in Kathmandu now, and Anuradha is fighting very hard. And sadly, through the grapevine, we hear that some of the people who own those places are really high up in the government, and uh, they are not going to be about to shut them down. Is that a good, is that, is that an answer to your question? <clears throat> Anybody we're else? Able to, I'm sorry. Anybody? We're, we're, I just want to add one. We're able to travel with impunity, by the way. Everybody knows Mayati Nepal. If you've got the Mayati 
badge. If they recognize you, you obviously you're a European, work for my team Nepal, they never stop us. But the roadblocks are serious. These aren't a bunch of kids with burning tires. This is a guy with an AK-47. But once he looks in the car, he sees my team Nepal, he says, go on. So luckily, we don't have the interference from the Maoist troops, except we do have the, the interference that the, the very uh, social services, the, uh, the electrical system, the grid is gone. The drinking water deteriorates constantly. We have more and more strikes, bandhas they call them in, in Nepali. And that continues, that continues. We do the best we can, but so far we're able to get around it because the Mayati Nepal has a reputation and Anurata is the Mother Teresa of Nepal. It's as simple as that. Yes, the, the, oh, beg your pardon, go ahead. Sorry, madam, will you be, yes, <coughs> go ahead, no, go ahead. found cases where these young ladies end up in the U.S.? That's one question. And then the other question would be, on the average, how long does it take, and this is good, and I know it's probably a life process, but how long have you seen that it takes these young people to kind of psychologically to come, <coughs> out, of, to come out of that, that cell? Um, sort of back to normal, you mean? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. You, mentioned, you mentioned the young lady in the fetal position. How long does that take for them to... Well, well the first uh, half of the question is no, and I'll let Brigitte do the rest, but no, we don't have many no, girls trafficked you know, in the United the, States. The, the very interesting thing is that, and we, we, don't, we can't say exactly why, but I don't know if you're aware that the trafficking uh, in this country, or I should not say in this country, I'd, I'd rather say the West, because I don't think that, I think we can plunge America and the West together, uh, industrial countries. Uh, the trafficking is really done by ethnic groups. In effect, the Brazilian traffic the Brazilians, the Russian traffic their Brazilian girls, mm -hmm. the Haitian traffic their Haitian girls, the Laotian do that, the um, Vietnamese do that. It's really a traffic within. We don't have, uh, I, I don't think there are enough Nepalese and enough money in the Nepalese mafia, whatever that means, to do that. It's easier for them to get lost into India and to take no risks. And to get visa to come to this country as a Nepalese is pretty hard. So we don't have that. The second part of your question is, um, I try not to be too Western and too Freudian when it comes to that. So I try to, although uh, psychology is part of my, but I try to withdraw it because when I see how they are capable of recovering. Uh, I am in awe of them. And I think the old days, you know, you had your favorite aunt or you had your cousin and you slept over with the cousins and you spoke all night and the aunties got together and they spoke about the grandmother who was a horrible woman. You know, that was therapy. You know, that was therapy. And they're still at that stage. And because they all have lived those nightmares, I have to tell you the only thing that I haven't been able to do because I, 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 I don't have the, the audacity to do this, but there is a part of me who would love to one day have a girl tell me what has happened to her, but I would never dare go there at all because this is a world that I didn't know and I have no rights to ever get to know that, but among themselves they do that. So the therapy is interesting. They have smiles on their faces. They can dance. I mean, just put the music and, and off they go. There is, there is dance every, every day. They're all gone and so they have that capacity. But it doesn't mean that they are not hurt and that it takes, and that some of them don't recover. There are a few of them. There's an early stage, by the way. Remember we said that Anurata trains these various girls in different ways to help. And we have girls who especially are trained to talk the girl back down, whether she's escaped from India or whether we've caught her at the border, she's terrified. She's in a police car. She's never been more than a few yards from her home. And so that process usually takes with the skilled sisters about two weeks before she's calm enough 
to begin to enter really the general population and begin to get better. So if you, if you may put a gun to my head, I'd say two weeks just to get her back into understanding where she is. And then the rest is, depends on the girl. And if we have serious cases, we do have psychologists <coughs> and psychiatrists. But uh, that's not the tendency uh, to, go, to go because the healing process is fantastic within themselves. Yes, the lady, yes. If you give them, if we give them money, you said? Yes. Well, um, the younger they are, the more chances, because forgive, this is a word I hate to use, but at the same time, is the only one I can think of in, in, in the context of sex trafficking. When they are damaged good, they are beings that are not of worthless in the eyes of society and in the eyes of their families, the chances are that we are going to take care of them uh, for, for a long time to bring them back uh, on their feet. However, if they are young and, have, and the family is willing to take them because um, we rescued them and all, they can go back to school. We follow up on them. We bring them back to school and hopefully they will have a normal life. The older they are, the more difficult it is because first of all, they've, they've become street smart. They are not going to go back into a village of shame and uh, plant a few potatoes and all. So this is when we train them. And they want independence. They want to go back outside in the world. They want to, we also have a micro um, credit system um, Nepalese have been merchants all their lives. Nepal, Nepal is between Tibet and India. And let me tell you, if you go to museum, they're full of those beautiful uh, statues that they've made. They've been merchants and it's, it's in their DNA. They are merchants and they are going, give them a little money and they're going to make tea and they're going to make some cookies and they're going to sell them to you. So they've got those resources also. Does that? So we have many success, success stories that way. Yes, madam, no, sir, sorry. Yes, governments are very, uh, uh, you know, who are, I always like to say, who are governments? Governments are only a reflection of the people of the country. The government really respect Mighty Nepal. It's uh, not uh, that I want to be uh, immodest, but Anuradha is a little bit of a tough uh, sister Teresa, mother Teresa in Nepal, so you respect her. Uh, even if you are not going to necessarily work with her, in search of making a difference in sex trafficking, but you're going to respect her work um, and you're going to not go against it. Um, the process is very slow, the laws are being changed slowly, but they still have a long way to go. Don't forget that uh, men and women are from a culture where in effect, those girls are from a lower rank than they are because a lot of the society is still run by the Brahmins as a whole. So it's going to take a little while, but we get there. And I want to say before I take another question, remember, I said that this afternoon, but remember, we today have, are able to talk about sex trafficking. We're even able to use words that not too long ago we would not be able to use. The sex trafficking is finally in the open. It's not something that happened yesterday. It has been going on for a long, long time. But today, you're here tonight. Okay. We are working because we are fed up with that and we want it to change. And in that, I want to, you to find a lot of hope because it's by all of us going and screaming from the top of our lungs that we are going to make a difference. So don't despair. We are getting <laughs> slowly. <laughs>
God, I, I wish she really cared. Excuse me, there is a lady who has a question. <laughs> yes, please. Well, I have to say, Mali became sort of a hero. Mali won in, forgive me for the day, but I would say 98, uh, around that. She won the... Um, Reebok. Reebok Award. She won the Reebok Award and came to this country. And, <laughs> and her daughter just had the most... Uh, she, she was taken away from her. But all the prostitutes and other people were taking care of her, and the daughter is now a solid little girl, and they're working with her mom and her dad in India. You're very welcome. Sadly, she, although I, you saw, uh, I don't know if you can remember, but there was one girl called Anita, and we particularly knew Anita well because she was at the border crossing, and Anita, um, was a fantastic border crossing soldier. She just was terrific. She, she, she knew she was on a mission. But sadly, uh, the brains didn't follow and uh, she fell down and uh, depressed and uh, married a man who was an alcoholic and recently she died. But, but when, she, when the other young lady won the Reebok Award, to show you about working to save their sisters, she took every penny of that money and went to Mumbai and set up her own clinic to help support Mayatee Nepal. Yes. You've elaborated on intervention, prevention, and awareness. How frequently does Mayatee engage in direct face-to-face consultation Well, in Kathmandu, I dare say that Anuradha does it every day. Uh, in Kathmandu, well, we don't do because we have sisters. You know, we have uh, we have sisters, uh, but we are constantly on the work. We sort of are are a um, a spider web of connection. You know, and we always get our net. You know, we are all busy starting to close a net, and we do rescues. But that's a process that is becoming more and more dangerous. Uh, when, even when we made it several years ago, you know, in, in the film, that was uh, new, so it was not so that now it's dangerous. Uh, we have to be much more careful. And um, just like everything else in life, nobody, many people now have no scruples to take you down and cut you and take the girls. and. So we, um, we don't do it as often in, because it also demands money. You know, a, a raid like this means that if we rescue eight, ten girls and we have to deal with the uh, uh, Indian authorities and sometimes they don't want to recognize them as, uh, as being, uh, because they are here illegally, so they are recognized as illegals. And then when we take back to Nepal, because they were taking out of Nepal without any papers, the Nepalese say, how can you prove you're Nepali? So, it's, it's big. It's, it's big, it's vast. Uh, but the rescues are becoming more and more dangerous. But we still do them. We still go out there. And uh, as a matter of fact, Sadly enough, we had one hour a man who was killed, and uh, it was said to be a car accident. And to this day, we will never know. And you have been threatened. Yes, yes, and and mighty has been threatened. Yes, yes. There was a, I saw a hand for a second over here. Oh, here we go. Well, you, you bring a good point, but um, you also probably saw slum, <coughs> slum dog millionaire. Yeah, I saw that. Yes. Uh, we are offending countries 
by showing that kind of picture. This is something that they don't like us to show. So I don't think we make matters worse in that sense, but what we do is that we irk, irk, without an H. Irk. When you marry a foreigner, irk. you know. Upset, yes. Yeah. We, <laughs> no, but my age, sometimes we are confused. We irk people and we upset uh, the authorities. And we can, um, that, that works against us. That works against the system, uh, you know, over there. They just say, why do you have to come to India and show that side of India when there are so many other sides? And why you as foreigners do that? So that is something that is diplomatically um, a no-no as far as they're concerned. But it doesn't affect it in the, in the way, you know, you asked your question. Well, the Minister of Health of Nepal said to me at a party one evening, we wish you'd stop bringing them back. I said, why? He said, well, they're sick, you know. That's the sort of support you get uh, from the government. And the other thing that we haven't mentioned yet, you know, uh, it, it's dangerous work. Uh, several of the people uh, who work in Nepal have their lives threatened. And uh, one of them has had to transfer their children to India to go to school because they're so concerned. Uh, when you put away a trafficker, he's the low man on a totem pole, and you've offended some higher-ups. So uh, some of this is quite dangerous work. And I think if the situation had been uh, not solved, because it's an impossibility uh, in a such a short uh, time, but if the, uh, the authorities had, taken, uh, had become aware of the system when it was still a... Did it do, I dare say, an artisanal trafficking. That is to say, it was still at that level. It was people, individuals. That would have been less, would have been less dangerous to handle, but the authorities did nothing. But I dare say that it has become a international mafia. You know, every country has their mafias, and they are dangerous, and I don't know if you know that, but Basically, sex trafficking has surpassed drug trafficking in revenues. We are now sex trafficking. It is easier to traffic a human being than to be caught with cocaine on your body. So therefore, I'll take the easy road and uh, traffic. So I, in, in monetar monetarily, they are ahead of us by a few billions. I can assure you. <laughs> yes? Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, is, um, are, are men who, uh, who frequent the, uh, the brothels of foreigners or people, uh, local people, and are there now schools, you know, d uh, directed to the Johns and all? Um, the first question is that in India, uh, and I, I like to really make a strong point that in India, there are no Foreigners, of course, uh, somebody can come back and say we have 2.2% uh, of uh, foreign. But as a whole, people will not go to India to uh, seek uh, sex. For some reason, the Western man will go to more of the Asian, South Asian uh, child of uh, uh, ma women of sadly child uh, of uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand. However, However, we are um, quite concerned and alert because Nepal is still a destination for tourists. And uh, thanks to the West uh, wanting to make everybody equal, and I stand personally um, objective, but we are trying to make legalization of prostitution in many, many countries throughout the world. And I say, 
if you want to get, be a prostitute tomorrow and make your life, I'll shake your hand and I'll say, it's not what I would do, but you're 21 and good luck. But in all those countries, if you bring uh, prostitution is becoming legal, it's going to be a very bad mess. It's going to be a way for women to get a living, and I'm not sure that I want to go there. Uh, it's very complex. It's very, very many feminists in the Western world are adamant that prostitutes must do what they wish to do, and we should leave them do what they want to do with their body. Um, I'm not sure that it is applicable throughout the world. But what's happening in Kathmandu is that because the police, and I was talking to a gentleman who was telling me, because now the police and the system and the international system is closing on and making things more difficult in countries like Thailand, we are hearing that now pedophiles are starting to go to Kathmandu. And we have arrested a French teacher and I think it's a Dutch man who, uh, uh, under the cover of uh, <coughs> feeding urchin on the street, was uh, doing that. So I'm, 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 I'm quite concerned. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, so what do we do with the Johns? The society is not ready for that. Um, women, it's not, it's not ready. I wish we could start one. But first of all, we have to have the law helping us gather those men in order to do it. And shame, although I wish same shame was real in our societies, and I mean our Western society, I would love that shame would come back a little. That would not hurt us. But as it has totally gone in our society, in Nepal, shame is still so big that you'd rather save your father, your brother, your, your, your husband even, of that shame rather than have him exposed to that. So it's still very much undercover. In the shadow, I don't see any. <laughs> well, any take picture. out a pencil and paper. There's going to be a quiz. <laughs> anyway, we certainly uh, are. Please. I beg your pardon. Is there any girl? That's all right. Is, is there any girl that you like to cover that you like to like spoken about with the Korean girl? Like can you have a Korean concert? We have girls who will, um, but they are the minority. We have a few girls, yes, who have been so traumatized physically <coughs> and mentally. First of all, if they have been traumatized physically, let's say that they've had a, a broken bone or you know, they are limping, or um, without being graphic, having uh, her inner parts torn apart, that she'll never be able to walk properly. She is a prisoner because she, she can't go back into having a normal life. So she is probably, uh, she may be functioning very well inside the institution, but she will never be able to reintegrate. And we have girls indeed who, for whom the trauma is so bad that um, they die of despair, but not too many. And uh, they stay at MIT also and are being comforted because there is no mental institution. They're being hospitalized. But I have to tell you, <coughs> yes, they are, but they are not very many of them. And if they are, they're very well taken care of. And we don't have any suicide. In Boston, in, uh, forgive me, in, in Kathmandu, but we, we have had uh, suicides inside the brothels, yes. Girls have committed suicide inside the brothels. But suicide uh, in Hinduism, as in Buddhism, is really um, not good because you really, uh, a Westerner speaking about reincarnation, you really mess up your reincarnation. So, uh, so suicide is not, seen, uh, is not seen well. So I think a Hindu will think, uh, and forgive me for making a very short um, 
explanation of suicide in the Hindu religion. I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. It means a lot to us. We thank you and very, very keep much. Keep us in your Thank hair. you very much. And please visit.